you know, um, nothing good is going to come from the deeper you dig. Welcome to the Film Trap Podcast. I am Chris Gore. I hope you are enjoying your October. I certainly am because this is the time I get to see all the horror films I have not had a chance to see throughout the year. And there are so many great indie horror films coming out. And I am excited to tell you about this one, The Deeper You Dig. Uh, this is a very ethereal, spiritual, um, sort of shades of Korean horror. Uh, and it's it's created by a family of filmmakers, a literally family of filmmakers. And I'm excited to have them on the Film Threat Podcast. Toby Poser, John Adams, and actress Zelda Adams, who is, I mean, you're all the filmmakers and you're also the leads of the film. I was blown away by this aspect um, that it really is, you know, co-directing, co-writing. It's, I mean, this is the ultimate, you know, family collaboration. Um, what, what, what inspired this story? And I, I really did not, uh, honestly, until like we were taught, like, I didn't realize you're all, uh, all related. So this is fantastic. Well, what inspired this uh, movie was I have a lot of nightmares. Um, I'm a nightmare guy and uh, I have a recurring nightmare that I buried a, a body and there, people are just about to discover it. And in my dream, I'm always like, oh, I, I feel so guilty, but I'm, I'm not the person I was when I killed that person. And so this movie is an exploration of guilt and it's an exploration of loss that that uh you know it's got the seven stages of of loss in it and um so that's what that's kind of what inspired it we uh zelda and i made a little horror movie a uh, test run first called the hatred that was like a test run to see what we thought about shooting in the winter and shooting a horror movie yeah it's basically just one long dark poem we like to say and it was totally an experiment and we found out that we truly love horror so we decided to make an even longer, kind of more in-depth horror movie. And we love it and we're gonna keep making more. Yeah, it's, um, I really love um, Echo, your character has this amazing, I mean, very deep relationship. Uh, I'm not making a joke there, I, was, I didn't plan on that. <laughs> but like, a, a relationship with her mother that, um, you know, goes beyond say, you know, uh, it goes into the spiritual realm. There's some incredible visuals. One in particular that struck me is where you're kind of speaking to your mother, but you're just sort of floating in the background. It's like I'm so many of these, um, the images and the way that you, you, it was it was like a painting. Did you use digital effects or, or were you really hanging? Like, how did you achieve some of these things? A lot of it is this like the amazing use of sound. It just shows like what you can really do when you're creative and on a budget, because I thought all of those effects were so powerful. Like, um, can you talk about like what these different visual elements, cause there's things that are shocking and weird and a twist. And you think, is that a dream? Is he seeing what he, he thinks he's seeing? I just thought that all of those, those effects were very, very useful in telling the story. Well, this is where we should introduce the, the honorary member of our family it was our special effects guy, Trey Lindsay, who is just, the coolest and smartest guy, the most talented, and he knows everything about film. So he created that floating <laughs> effect among others in the film. And um, and he's, he has a young daughter who he had hang from a tree. So I think those might be her feet, Sam's feet. And yeah, it's, it's Trey. Well, it's uh, those effects really are powerful. John, I, I, I wanna mention to you, I have also had that dream that same dream and it's this, I mean, it's like a nightmare because you've accidentally killed someone or someone is dead and you feel responsible. And then all, you know, everything that comes after that, the, do you hide it? Do you like, it's the taking of a life is something that is in and of itself, I think fairly horrific. So that it was inspired by a dream. I think you and David Lynch have something in common. 
Um, well, I'm glad you have that dream too. And you know, I think it's like the misery of guilt, you know, and I think that that's really what we wanted to explore. Well, one of the themes that we wanted to explore in the deep you dig was the misery of having done something horrific. And you try to hide it, and the the deeper you bury it, the more it comes out. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What What is it like? I mean, I've interviewed actually on the podcast. I've interviewed three married couples that are co-directors. Right. I've never interviewed a family of mm -hmm. filmmakers. Uh, I think that I. So I'm super impressed. How does that dynamic work, and how do you separate the like this is work and then hey we're going to applebee's although i would assume i feel like i feel like having seen your film i'm not sure you're the, the you would probably be we're, at we're banned from applebee's we're banned from applebee's yeah i was gonna say i don't think that i can't but like how does how does the collaboration work because um it just i feel like you you were so much your characters i mean just seeing you now and just like uh seeing how how you are portrayed on screen, I would not have guessed this at all. I think that um, our teamwork, it runs very smoothly when we're making films. Uh, I like to say that we're all, literally we're just best friends and we're all sharing our liking of film together as we're making it. And we don't, a lot of people ask if we fight, we don't really fight on set. And if we ever do have a disagreement, we say, all right, we're gonna film it three ways. And then the best way is the one that we keep in the movie. <laughs> And you know, I get we've been doing this for a while now. This is our 10 year anniversary as a filmmaking family. Uh, this was our fifth feature together. So when we started, our kids were six and 11. Our older girl, Lulu, was off at college. So she wasn't in the deeper you dig. But um, so we've kind of been been practicing the moves to this dance for a while now. And, uh, and it just made sense that we all wear every hat. And we take turns in front of the camera, behind the camera, and uh, writing and direct. It just it works for us because we spend all this time together anyway. And it's sort of like we don't know at this point where our lives um, take over from the film, or the film takes over for our, our lives. It's just it's pretty natural by now. Well, I, I'm a, as I mentioned at the top, I'm a, a big fan of horror. I also like um, smart horror. I feel like while there are there are gore effects in this film. Um, it's, I mean, yes, there are a bunch of gore effects. I feel like what this film really focuses on is more the psychological aspects of horror, the the manifestation of that dream, John, that you've had that is so horrific, the the, the taking of a life. Yet hunting is a thread th throughout the film. Can you talk about that? And are you uh, hunters in real life? Do you? Uh, uh, cause I think that the, where you shot it is very beautiful. Um, is, is that, uh, can, can you discuss that a little bit and how that wove its way into the, into the film? Yeah, it kind of just, I mean, the hunting thing, we, we, we're from the Catskills, which is a huge hunting, you know, territory. Um, everybody gets a couple deer for the winter and we actually don't hunt ourselves, but all of our neighbors do and our friends do and Zelda soccer team does. And um, so it's just a part of life that we're used to. And it just added such a great element since, you know, there's so much hunting going on in the movie. It's such a great metaphor. You know, Zelda's character is hunting me. Toby's character is hunting me. I'm in turn hunting the kid, you know, it's um, so it just really worked well and it added a lot of tension. And also it, it gave us the excuse of using a lot of animals in our movie because there are a lot of animals, dead animals up around us. And it just is just kind of a, a way of life up there. And so it really just fits seamlessly into the, the movie. It just seemed very organic, and and the tone also having this this sort of sense of loss, and yet, um, you know, the relationship Toby with with Zelda, your character, the mother and the dog, I, I thought was so fantastic. Where did the thing with the coffee come from at the beginning? Is that a real kind of coffee that exists? I had never heard of that. Oh, you mean the coffee out of the deli? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's a really specific. <laughs> flavor that um there's a callback to it but like does that really exist that that coffee like believe it or not 
Yes, I mean, it does. It exists. And actually, we wrote that into the script as we were shooting that scene and we saw it and it was like, oh, my God, look at the name of this coffee. This will be a great thing. Toby's really good at putting full circles of, you know, full story circles into the script. And she's the one who put that full story circle into the script. And it really pays off. You know, it really oh, does. Yeah. So that was really convenient. And it was just kind of a spur of the moment thing. Well, I, I want to ask, like, just as such a, a collaborative and artistic family, um, is this like, I mean, I just looking at this film, it's inspiring. It's like, look, look, if you use the resources, what's around you, you can make something that's incredibly affecting to so many, uh, you know, especially fans of horror. Um how does that dynamic work? Like, is this something where you sort of take off a month, make a movie, and then you have to go through the process of, I mean, everything with indie film is a struggle, right? Like from getting it finished to getting it out there. So, and you said you made five previous films over the course of, you know, 10 years. That's an impressive output. Are you able to sustain that in terms of just like what you put into it resources wise and then what you get back financially? Um, just just as something for indie filmmakers that would watch this to like, you know, finding that sustainability model. I think the dream for every filmmaker is that's what I do for a job. Um, but I think so many of us that work in the in the independent artist realm you have to kind of take a gig here and do this and then do your art on the side i've always had a job and a passion project but are you able to make that balance work and then financially are are you able like every two years to put something out and and make it sustainable yeah you were able to do it because we really use what we have. We don't go into something and say, we need $100,000 to make this film. No, it's more like, hey, do we have $10,000 to make this film? Or, you know, let's just use what we have. We, I think our, our, our weaknesses end up being our strengths. Sounds kind of hokey, but it really is true. We just use what we have and make sure we use them well. And we never let it stop us. You know, we, we don't have any fancy equipment or lighting. Uh, Everyone knows how to use the camera. Zelda and John were the DPs on this film. Zelda's really good with, with the camera. She's been learning. She's been knowing, learning how to do it since she was six. So um, sometimes we just look out the window and we're like, "Oh my God, there's this insane blizzard outside." Now we got to shoot the scene, and we didn't have to pay for that at all. Yeah, I guess, I guess um, you didn't have to pay for the blizzard. It's production value, right? <laughs> I mean, pr production value is definitely location. Um, so a uh, question for Zelda, like how in growing up in a filmmaking family, what is this? And having worked with cameras since you were six, that must give you a different perspective as an actress. It adds a whole other layer. Yeah. I don't talk to a lot of actresses that have also been behind the camera. So how does that change your perspective and your performance? Well, as my, as Toby said, I've kind of been doing it since I was six. So I've really grown to love, um, Cinematography. It's my favorite thing. I think I, I like it more than acting and I it could be something that I want to pursue. And I, I love seeing how our films develop from our first film to the film that we have now and how our cinematic shots change um, and kind of the equipment that we'll get over time. Like we just bought um, a Ronin and a drone. So I just get really excited to kind of um, advance our uh, cinematography for each film like our production value yeah our production value that's a good way to put it <laughs> well yeah i i mean i think it certainly must give you a different perspective you know acting in front of the camera having that experience you know behind the camera uh, i think is i i think that's very uh, it's very very unique for sure uh what i'm curious what's what's next and now i now i need to discover these other films because uh, the DPU dig is actually coming out. It's video on demand everywhere. And then there's a special edition coming from Arrow releasing, which Arrow, uh, for those uh, not in the know, Arrow uh, releasing puts out um, amazing DVDs. They really put out like if if you're out on Arrow releasing on 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 DVD, um, it's something it's something special uh, for sure. And I think you mentioned, did you say it was also on Shutter? Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's so, on Shutter now as well. So many different ways to see this. 
I, I, I think, I, so I, what I'm saying is there's no excuse for you not to see this right now. <laughs> listening to this or watching it. What, what, what's, what are your, um, having seen this in front of an audience, and I'm curious if you had an opportunity before everything got to where it was, did you have an opportunity to see the film with an audience so you could see some of the reactions, especially for some of the jump scares and, and, and the effect sequences? Yeah, we were really lucky that we had a great festival run. And for us, that's a great place for us to learn what we've done well and what we haven't done as well as we should have. Because we're in, you know, the first time you sit down and you watch your movie with an audience, you learn so much about what you've done. And you're amazed that you didn't understand that until you're sitting with an audience. It's really incredible what that does. And then the Q&As and the reviews and things like that, basically, um, the festivals that we've done have just been a wonderful learning experience. And now we're going to apply those lessons um, to our next movie, Hellbender, um, because it's those are just priceless lessons that you can't get any other way than sitting with an audience. Okay, so I've got the exclusive Hellbender in the <laughs> next film. And hopefully when it comes out, we will be seeing it with an audience because I, I have a suspicion that things are going to open up in 20 in 2021 um but that's great that you did have an opportunity i, I you, you cannot end, underestimate seeing your film in front of a live audience in a dark theater with you know in a packed screening maybe someday in the future soon you feel the energy in the room you can feel you don't need focus group cards to tell you what's working what's not working you feel that energy and you go oh this went on too long or oh this People didn't understand this or whatnot. Um, before I let you go, I do want to like compliment you. The name of your character, Zelda Echo, I thought was such a clever name. The way that, that I, I feel like it just ties in thematically with uh, a lot of what's going on. So um, what I love is just that the attention to detail that was paid, including the naming of your character. Did you? Do you have any comments on that, or did you kind of realize that how more meaningful that character name would be? Well, I think that we definitely try to slip in some symbolism <laughs> any way that we can. <laughs> right, um, yeah. But I think the name was actually Toby's idea, right? Or Yes, it was. Yeah, and same with Toby's character's name, Ivy. Ivy. Yeah, my character's name, Ivy, is someone who's tenacious and will not let, let go. I mean, I, I think I, I love... I love um, I love when things cross over, and so finding some. I mean, Kurt is just Kurt. The murder is just kind of Kurt. He sort of wasn't worthy of our uh, symbolism, but uh, he gets no symbolism. He's just uh, uh, yeah. No, it, that was just a fun thing to come up with. Well, um, it's a pleasure to to talk to you all and to meet you, and I'm also happy to see that John is uh, not quite as evil and horrible and threatening. As I like the new hair, is what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely we're going a little mellower. You know, we went yeah. evil, now we're gonna go a little mellower here. Yeah. Well, your haircut in the film does really fit that character. There's just something menacing about about that haircut. That so. would be a fun haircut to act with because as Kurt falls to pieces, that haircut gets pretty crazy too. So it was a character in and of itself. Wow. Well, um, I want to uh, thank our sponsor, Storyblocks. Go to storyblocks.com slash film thread, all sorts of tools for filmmakers. And I want to thank uh, the filmmakers behind The Deeper You Dig, Toby, John, and Zelda. This is uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. This is the first time I've talked to a filmmaking family. That's really amazing. So... Thanks, Chris. It thank means you. so much to be on Film Thread. Thank you so much. So oh, really? Yes, absolutely. Oh. Well, thank you for thank you for like just making a film that I feel shows what you can use using the tools that you have and something that can be so powerful and 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 I, I think people need to see it. I think they definitely see shades of David Lynch and and Korean horror woven in that is really effective, including the setting. It just it it, it all works. So congratulations. Thank cool. you. Thank you.